Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the NHL draft is over and we're here recapping free agency and we're doing all this at the end of October. What a weird year it is. Usually we'd be wearing shorts when we do this, but instead I got almost knee high snow in the backyard. I'm Dan alongside Matt and Matt, isn't this a weird year? Like we should be talking about the start of a season right now. Well, we're usually recording this episode at uh, the development camp over at Windsport, having interviews with players, talking with the management, hanging out with the other media people all that kind of stuff and yeah instead at home buried in snow wondering why there's not hockey on right before halloween (laughs) well that's it i mean usually the season starts beginning of october and here we are not even sure when the season's gonna start yeah usually usually at this point talking about the bad start for the flames yeah like eight ten games into the season and like what's going on yep (laughs) fire that coach well, let's jump into it. We got a lot to talk about. Um, let's start with the announcement that was made, I think, the day after we record our last show, and that's that for the next season, the Calgary Flames are going retro. They're going to be bringing back what was their third jersey for the last couple of years, the 80s look, as the uh, home jersey, the red, and then they're going to bring the white jersey they wore at the Heritage Classic in as the road jersey for at least for next season. They'll keep their previous home jersey with the black C as their third, Um, but we're going to have very much a retro look. I'll give you my thoughts on this first, and then, Matt, I'd love to hear yours. I like the idea of going back to the retro color scheme. I I always liked the black as an accent color that we saw in the 90s, sort of around the sea, but not as the actual uh, sea color. I kind of wish, though, that they didn't just go with the 80s jerseys. It seems like a cop-out to just go back to the old ones. I would have liked to see them take that color scheme and create a new jersey design, create something brand new, um, especially sales wise, I think a lot of people already have those jerseys, but I th- I think it would have been cool to do something modern with a throwback look to it. Yeah, and that's exactly my thoughts on it. Like it, it it's a, a huge upgrade. But like I'm not gonna even argue. Like it's a huge upgrade to what the Flames jerseys have been. Like frankly, over the last 13 years, I think the Flames have had one of the three worst jerseys in the entire NHL. I would say so, since the '04 version with the the downward V striping. Yeah, uh, basically the Capitals and the Senators uh, with their regular jerseys were the only ones that were consistently worse than the Flames, and you know uh, it's a huge upgrade for what you know the the move but i think that it just uh another half measure sort of like that uh script third jersey that they had where like elements were really good but they didn't carry it through and and i think that script third jersey is a great example of a new design we saw where black was still there but wasn't as prominent yeah and you know like even that jersey like if they had uh like rounded the shoulders instead of that weird yoke thing through the flaming sea on it and you know kept the shoulder patches like that would have been probably one of if not the nicest flames jersey that they've ever had yeah i mean even going back to the 90s with the pedestal if you were to take the pedestal off i liked when they introduced black as an accent color i really did and i Mm -hmm. think if you were to keep black as an accent color I think there's a lot of cool stuff they could have done with the new jerseys. Yeah, and, you know, like, I even... One of the things that, like, I I was thinking is, like, with that pedestal jersey, the white on the shoulders, like, if you were to actually extend that white all the way down to the gloves, sort of like that one year of all-star jerseys. Well, that's kind of what they had. The white in the 90s went pretty much past the elbow. Yeah, like, just do something unique like there's so many different ways that you can go with the the, like the flames like their jerseys have always seemed like creative but not enough where like because like just the nature of the logo and the neat the team name like there are so many things that jump to mind like especially for myself being a graphic artist and designer it and it's like they're just not going but at far least they've never done being... flame on the jersey 
Like I think no. that's you know, if this was an ECHL team, I think you would just have flame coming up from the bottom and flame coming up from the from the sleeves and calling it a day. Yeah, sort of like the horse head logo, you know, with the the flames shooting out of the nose. It's like, um, yeah, that's an awful logo. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I think part of this could be too, Matt, that this is a half measure because where do people buy their jerseys? They buy them either at the Dome or when they're going to the Dome and not knowing what the Flames are doing this year. And even if we're going to have fans, I think it might have been easy to go with a retro look. And I wouldn't be surprised that if, say, for the 21-22 season, we're back in the building if they unveil a new jersey then. And maybe it's a good idea to give them a year to come up with something new. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like, I don't think this is going to be our jersey for the next 5-10 years. If nothing else, I think we'll have a new uniform when we hit the new building. Yeah. That would be my expectation as well. Like, basically like a tip of the hat to, like, all of the fans who have been calling for the retro jerseys until the new new arena and then here's our new look and yeah i mean it's it's an anniversary season for this year you know i think it makes sense to go back to this for one year but i would really like to see and i mean even on the the white jersey and the red i guess just having the you know the the three colors like the red the yellow and the white on the red jersey the yellow doesn't stand out around the sea even just putting the C with a black outline on it, you know, like they did in the 90s, I think would make it pop a little bit more. Like, I'd just like to see them, yeah, do a little bit more work and come up with something new with the retro color scheme. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you were to, and I did this in Photoshop a few years ago, I took the 90s jerseys, took the pedestal off of them. They actually look pretty good. Yeah. Oh, you know, I know. Like, even I, the I just made a horizontal four... striping. Yeah, like even the 04 jersey was really good. And, yeah. like, you know, like there's different ways of doing things. You know, and like, I, you know, like the 04 jersey, like, I, I kind of like how, like, the base part of the jersey w- was kind of like a, a nod to, like, the mountains and such. You know, with the V type thing at the bottom. Like, there are different ways that you can do things that are interesting and. You know, it just the the jerseys they're going with are just kind of vanilla standard ish hockey jerseys. And and they were cool in the eighties, but we've moved past that, I think. Yeah. The thing that does confuse me though is if you want to go with retro this year and the flames, even when they announced it, were saying, you know, we're going retro, why would you go with last season's jersey for the third? Like if it was me, I would almost go with the old four jersey for the third. So that you're still getting a throwback even on the third jersey. Yeah. You know, it just, it just seems like we haven't created anything new. We're just, you know, I mean, they've already got all the Heritage Classic jerseys sitting around. They're just putting different jerseys in a different order. They haven't created anything new here. Yeah. So, I w- but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the year that we come back, um, that, that we have some new for fans to buy. And I'm honestly surprised there's going to be third jerseys. We don't know what travels is going to look like next year. But I think whatever it looks cool. like, you don't want to be carting around another jersey everywhere you go. Yeah, well, they're also going to have a fourth jersey as well, apparently. The so, Flames are? Yeah, all the teams are. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be like a weird reverse retro theme thing. There have been a few that have been announced already, but yeah, it's kind of a special like one-off maybe, or two-off type of a jersey. Well, trying to get fans yeah. to buy something. Yeah, exactly. Well, we've seen that in the NBA where like they have like four or five different jerseys that they wear throughout the year and why not? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. I don't know. I I've never been a fan of that. Give me your home, your road, maybe your third, but I, I want my team to look the same all year. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't gone out and got one, I know there's a lot of places now that are still selling last year's Flames jerseys on sale, and you can easily just pick up the third jersey and you'll be ready for next year. So I saw um, a store today that had 40% off. If you look around the web, you can probably get a good deal. Well, with that, Matt, let's go chronologically here. The next thing that happened was the NHL draft, and the Calgary Flames uh, were busy at the draft table i'd say the biggest news probably the flames traded down twice we usually see tree trade that pick away not trade down but the flames traded down twice got the 24th overall pick uh, and picked up connor zari in the first round second round with the 50th overall pick they picked up jan kuznetson a defenseman from russia 
Third round pick, another defenseman, Jeremy Poirier with 72. The 80th pick was Jer- Jake Boltman, a defenseman from the U.S. Uh, the fourth round pick, number 96, was Daniel Chechelev, a goaltender from Russia. The fifth round pick, uh, 143, was Ryan Francis, a right winger from the QMJHL. The sixth round pick, 174, was Roy Kearns, a centerman from the OHL. And the last pick for the Flames was Ilya Soliev, a defenseman from uh, Belarus who's playing in Russia. So the Flames didn't trade out of the draft this year as we thought they might. Got pretty much a little bit of everything, a center, a couple defensemen, a goalie, a winger. Um, I know there's a few players you really want to highlight in this list, Matt. Who do you want to talk about from this group? Well, it was a very good uh, thing for the Flames to trade down from 19 to 24 because they were going to take Connor Zari at 19. So they still got their guy, and they managed to get Jeremy Poirier and Jake Boltman for just the ability to go down a couple of spots. Which, you know, with the Flames' lack of defensemen in the system, getting two decent defense prospects for literally nothing, awesome. You know, like, good on Treliving for getting, recouping some... Good asset management. Yeah, because we've been seeing this team shed draft picks to make acquisitions, and we didn't lose anything we got the player that we still wanted at at 19 at 24 and you kind of had to know they their guy was on the board when they trade down twice like how often do you see a team trade down twice yeah and it made sense entirely and it made sense for the two teams that traded up to get the guy that they were wanting just wasn't the player that the flames were interested in so it just worked out in our favor and if either of those two players make the NHL down the road, then hey, that's just a free player for literally nothing. So, th- which that would be awesome. So, uh, do you want to do you want to break down any part of Connor Zari and his game for new Flames um, fans? Yeah, Connor Flames Zari. Fans not familiar with him. Uh, he was not one of the players that I was hoping for uh, for the Flames draft. Um, with uh, the selections uh, that were available, guys like uh, Maverick Bork and uh, Jacob Perot, th- those guys profile more as like middle six wingers if they make the NHL. Where he, and he, with the potential of being more of an impact scorer, Connor Zari, he's an older uh, player. He's one of the oldest players in this draft, but he's a very good two way player and he's a very good defensive forward and uh he's a very good physical player and he's got a good to, shot too yeah it, the most easy comparable would be like we just selected michael backland 2.0 and he is a he's able to do things at both ends of the ice he's a physical player he's very good defensively and you know, he will make the NHL. Like, I, I think that with his overall makeup, there's no reason why he shouldn't make the NHL. The main thing with him is that you're more likely going to get a third-line center out of him than anything higher up in the lineup. But you look at guys with that same profile in years gone by, you get guys like Michael Backlund who turn into second-line centers, even a guy like Ryan Kessler who turned into a star forward for Vancouver. You can get that kind of a development trajectory, but more likely you're going to get a a very good third, fourth-line center that will help this team down the road. Well, we've talked about this in the past. I mean, when you're picking 19th, 20th, you're not necessarily going to get the star player, the guy that's going to lead your team for years, the Matthew Kachucks, that sort of thing. But I think that, like you said, he's a guy who's got a role in the team, and if you look at him as a good two-way center, a guy like Backlund, and you could put on a line with two of those top sharpshooters, he's the guy that could balance that line and bring some defensive skill to it. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, like, this is a pick that separates the Flames from a team like the Oilers, who would always go for the star-caliber talent. Like, 
there are 12 forward positions and you need to have quality guys at all 12 forward positions and and they can't all be snipers no and a guy like zari he has the right makeup for a winning team uh you you need to have physical guys who are engaged on the ice and can dig pucks out and like one of his best skills is fighting in the corners to get pucks out and like that's very useful and you know you need all parts of your team contributing in the same direction and i think that getting a guy like Zari is a very useful middle six forward type guy moving forward and hopefully he develops as he's looking like he will yeah good good pick for the flames there maybe not the guy we wanted but you know especially considering you traded down twice i think they still got a, a really good player there yeah and this year's draft is also rather deeper than uh, amongst forwards than normal if this was say last year's draft zari probably goes 10th or 11th it's just that there's just happens to be a, a large number of good forwards this year so we got the benefit out of that well, I'm talking about the D forwards, the Flames use their next three picks in defensemen, and one of the guys you said you wanted to chat about was the seventy, the seventy second overall pick for the Flames, Jeremy Poirier, yeah, for St. Uh, John of the QMJHL. Uh, I'll just briefly touch on Kuznetsov and Boltman. Uh, Kuznetsov is a decent defensive defenseman, six foot four, two hundred and ten. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of offense out of this guy, but he his physical package is it's good enough where he could be an NHL player down the road. And you need defensive defensemen too. You can't have six, you know, offensive defensemen. No. And it, like the, sometimes those ty type of picks do not pan out like uh Keegan Kanzig, but then for every one of those, you get a guy like Josh Manson. So, you know, and if Kuznetsov turns into that kind of a guy, great. Awesome. If not, well, hey, you, you know, we need defensemen anyway in the system, so that'll be useful. Uh, Jake Boltman, uh, another decent two-way-ish defenseman. A lot of potential. Uh, he'll be going to college, so we'll see, basically. And Buys uh, four years at least with his rights. Yeah, and you get to see whether or not he's worth a contract at the end of it. Um, Jeremy Poirier, though, he was actually rated to go around where the Flames picked in the first round, and he fell all the way down to 72. Now, this is a player that is very much like Oliver Shillington, uh, very much an off all offense, uh, very spotty defense type player. Um, he had uh, quite a number of points uh last season uh 53 20 goals uh, 33 assists in 64 games uh in saint uh john and he's just a very good offensive player he himself has identified that he really needs to work on his defensive game so this will be a, a more of a project guy who over the next three four or five years is going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting to figure out the defensive side of game, the game in order to become an NHL defenseman. But if he can, he'll be a decent one just because of his offensive skill. Yeah, and if not, I think he's the kind of guy, and you need these guys too, he's the kind of guy I think who could be you know, your, your top AHL guy for a while who gets the call-ups when you need somebody. And we often look at guys, you know, if they're not in the NHL, they're a bust. You need good guys to help mentor and, and develop those young players coming through the system, too. Yeah, it, like, think of guys like Brett Kulak or Ryan Culkin in the past, or, or Shillington or Anderson. Just lots of skill, but lots of holes in the game. And if they can figure it out, great. If not, they can help everybody else, so... One way and, or another, it'll work and out. And with Seattle coming in, I mean, there's going to be 32 new guys who, or let's say 25 new guys who get jobs that wouldn't have got a job before. So what an NHL player looks like is going to be a little bit different in the next couple of years. True. Um, why don't you tell us, Matt, a little bit about the player the Flames took in 96, the goaltender, Daniel Chechlev. Yeah, this was a guy that, like, everybody's like, um, who? 
the NHL didn't have him on their draft sheets. Like, everybody's like, um, what? <laughs> and uh, the Flames might have uh, snuck one in here. The um, Flames have been good at finding those guys no one's heard of in Europe, though. I mean, we did it with Riddick. We did it with Zaga Doolin. We're good yeah, at, at finding European goalies. Yeah, and Chechalov thus far in 10 games in the MHL, which is the Russian Junior League, uh, he's 10-0 and 0, uh, with a 1.84 goals against average and like a 940 save percentage. So, you know, um, to compare that, uh, other good Russian goalies like Samsonov and um, a handful, like basically all the... Russian goalies that have come up through the system lately uh, around the NHL, like his stats in that same league are on par with all of theirs. So, you know, the Flames might have got themselves a top flight goalie prospect in the fourth round and just have to wait and see as his season continues whether or not there's more there or not this is a guy i can see needing some hl seasoning when they eventually bring him over yeah this will probably be a three or four year out if he makes it but it at least the early returns you know a couple weeks after the draft hey he's doing really good we'll see a few months from now or like next year but you know it, the early returns are looking very good Anything about Ryan Francis, Roy Kearns, or Ilya Soliev who you want to talk about? Uh, basically, the two forwards are offensively skilled guys with holes in their game. That's Francis it's, and Kearns. Yeah. But and you're going to have it, holes when you're drafted in round 5-6. Yeah, and that's kind of been the Flames' mantra lately of getting offensively skilled guys that, you know, and they're both shorter uh, I think they're both like 5'10". So, yeah, you know, Fran it's... Francis 5'9", Kieran's 5'10". Yeah, and it's... They're just those types, like... Guys like Matthew Phillips or Andrew Mangiapane, who have a lot of skill. And if the dart hits, great. If not, well, hey, they're going to be a good AHL scorer for you. That'll help guys like Zari and Peltier and all the rest of them make the NHL down the road. Uh, Solyov is a good offensive defenseman. He's currently playing in the KHL right now with two assists in 11 games. The thing I found when I looked at this uh, draft selection is for probably the first time in a while, the Flames, I don't know if it was deliberate or not, but they got some big boys. Like, you know, the Flames have been criticized for going with smaller players. Zari's six foot. Kuznetsov is six four. Poirier's six foot. Boltman six one. Chechlyev's six three. Uh, Soliev 6'2", like a lot of bigger guys than we've seen the Flames draft in the past. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, like, I, I've always been a, like, if all things are equal, go with the bigger player. But, like, if you look at, like, Francis and Curran's, they're clearly better offensively than the other guys that were available. Go with the skill. Like, if the skill is just better than... Go with that and let it the chips fall where they may. But, you know, it, yeah, it's good to see, like, that they're not going, like, 5'10 uh, or shorter with the, the first four rounds anyway. For sure. Anything else with the draft you want to touch on? Uh, I think that the Flames just did another good job of getting, infusing more skill into the organization, and early returns on all of the prospects good for now i think we have to remember we didn't get as much time to scout this year as we maybe would have because everyone's season was shortened so i think a lot of teams were in that boat of you know what let's just make some picks and see what happens yeah and like next year's draft is going to be a really weird experience if uh nobody <laughs> is able to actually scout properly, like if there's no games. You could for... end up with a Kyle Wellfed scenario where you saw a guy two years ago, he gains 50 pounds eaten during the, uh, you know, during the pandemic, and he comes to camp 50 pounds overweight. And it's like, um, great, awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I don't want to say too much about these guys because, like you said, we haven't seen a lot of them. I think Zari's the one we know the most about. 
But I think we just have to wait and see how it pans out. And I don't think the Flames did any better or any worse than any other team this year. Yeah, it's one of those things that, like, it's also hard because, like, normally we'd be discussing these people while watching them at development camp. But, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, so. and that's what I mean. You're, you know, we haven't seen them. We're not going to see them for a while. Who knows if some of these guys will even play this coming season. Um, you know, we, we have to wait and see what's going to go on with some of these players. Yeah. Well, let's make one more note before we get to our main event today, which is free agency, and that is that the uh, the Calgary Flames have assigned Yusuf Valamaki to Sweden. He's playing in the Swiss League for – or, sorry, the Swedish League for his hometown team the Elves Tempere of the SM Liga League. And uh, Brad Living talked about this in the media availability, pretty much saying, you know what, Yuso was out all last season. He didn't play a single game. They're thinking it's better for him to go to Sweden, to his hometown where he's familiar, where he, you know, he can stay in his own place and get his legs under him there than bringing him to the NHL and maybe playing him, you know, number five, six minutes. So he'll probably get... And if you look at the minutes he's already playing, that league's already started. He's nine games in. He's almost getting, you know, one, two minutes. So, again, we're talking... And, and about- he's also leading the team in scoring and leading the league amongst defensemen in Ten scoring. points in nine games, yeah. And looking very good defensively as well, so no complaints whatsoever. He's wearing the golden helmet, which in that league, the leading scorer on the team wears a gold helmet, so that's nice to see. That way you know who you got to block. Yep. Um, and you and I were talking about this for the show. I don't know, and I have yet to get any answers from the people I've asked at the league and at the team, if the transfer rules are different this year, but in previous seasons, once you send a guy to Europe, you can't bring him back that season. Um, and if you do want to bring him back in the off season, you have to clear waivers if you're waiver eligible, which I don't know. I don't think you so is. Um, so I wouldn't expect to see him back here for the NHL season, but as much as his Flames fans would want to see him, Probably it's better for him to be playing in Sweden this year and getting top minutes than coming and being, you know, a bottom three guy for the Flames. Yeah, I don't really know how that'll work uh, just because everything is so up in the air. I think that the NHL might be, like, uh, treating it more like uh, during the lockout where, like, everybody's just like, yeah, we're playing in Europe and, okay, now the season's back and we'll just... You know. Well, it's not just up to the NHL either. It's up to the Swedish league, and they're not going to want to lose a bunch of guys midseason because they're going to need to replace them. Yeah. You have to have a transfer agreement between both teams. The NHL can't just swipe their guys back. True. Right? It'll so be I, interesting to see. Yeah, I can't see all these you know, European leagues. I mean, think if Yuso's your best player, and all of a sudden you're getting close to playoffs and the Flames go, no, we want him back. Like, you could be screwed. So I think in some ways, once you're over there, especially with COVID travel and stuff, even if they want to bring him back, he's going to have to quarantine for a while. I think you might be better, even if you could, just to leave him over there. Yeah, we'll see. At least he's doing really good, and that's always awesome, and hopefully that just continues. Well, Matt, it's time for the main event. Uh, our yes. free agency discussion. Lots of contracts to talk about this year between. Yeah, players... like I think this might be like the combination of like four free agency shows for us for the amount of transactions that the Flames have done. We'll see if we need to cut this into a couple. We can, but uh, let's quickly talk about the players we lost, and then we'll get into the meat of our conversation, which are the guys coming in. The players that we lost, we lost Cam Talbot to Minnesota. He signed a three-year, three point six million dollar deal there. Jankowski to Pittsburgh, one one year, one way, seven hundred thousand. Tobias Reeder went to Buffalo for seven hundred thousand one year. Alan Quine goes to Edmonton, seven hundred fifty thousand. Ryan Lomberg to Florida on a two year. John Gillies to St. Louis on a one year. Derek Forbort to Winnipeg on a one million dollar deal, and T.J. Brody to Toronto, four years, five million. The only other player really that the Flames lost who hasn't signed is Hamonic. Looking at that list, Matt, any contracts there that you think either um, kind of silly either because they're too high or too low for that player? Anyone that we got a great that someone got a great deal on or overpaid for? I think that all of the contracts were about the correct value. Um, I thought Talbot uh, was a little rich. Uh, even then, not really. Like, not much. Like, 3.5, 3.25 would have been more of what I was expecting, but that seems adequate for, like, a 1A, 1B-type goalie. Um, 
I mean, Jankowski yeah. to Pittsburgh league minimum is about right. Toby Reader league minimum is about right. Um, I'm surprised Alan Quine couldn't find anybody else than Edmonton, but that's about right. Um, Gillies and Lomberg, both league minimums, as far as I can tell, those are right. Four board is maybe the one that seems a little light to me. Yeah. Like a, a one year, one mil deal, like I wouldn't have minded him coming back for that, but meh. I- yeah, I, I think, though, at the same time, if you look, the Flames only have a million dollars of cap space. I think you could find a number seven, which I think he would be right now, for a lot cheaper. Um, and then uh, TJ Brody, not... We've we've seen the ups and downs of Brody here, and I wouldn't have paid the $5 million, but I think Toronto got about market value for him. Yeah. Uh, Brody is fine but like honestly with the flames signing rasmus anderson to that contract um back during the season as soon as that was signed i'm like yeah tj brody's probably going to go to toronto (laughs) Uh, just because that's where he's from so it made entire sense yeah i mean brody's 30 so this is probably the contract that is really his last big money deal so i'm glad he was able to get some money from toronto yeah, and twenty million's not nothing to shake a stick at. So no, good for him. And you know, I'm wishing him all the best in Toronto. I just uh, I didn't expect him back. Um, I didn't expect him or Hamnick back, frankly, at any point um, during this season. So um, it's disappointing, but uh, the Flames have to just move on, and they already have. Well, I was going to say, it's disappointing, but I think it also shows the depth we have, right? If we had to, I think we would have re-signed Brody for that price. But the fact that Anderson's come as far as he has, especially, I think we can afford to let those guys go because we have defensemen developing. Yeah, well, you look at uh, Valimaki and how well he's playing. Exactly. You could easily slot in in a a 3-4 spot. So as, he, as Flames fans, well, I think it's tough to see a guy who's been here as long as Brody go. Yeah, it, it's exciting because, like you said, Valley, Raz, we've got some young guys who can replace them. Yeah, it's not like, oh, we, we're we now screwed. What are we going to do on defense? We have nothing. It's like, okay, yeah, the, the, that's disappointing. But we also have all of this. So, yeah, it, it's like under normal circumstances, it'd be like a devastating loss to lose a guy like Brody, but it's like, yes and no. Well, and if we talk about the players coming in, I think while we're talking about Brody, I think the Flames made a lateral move in signing Chris Tanev for half million dollars less, and I think that half million dollars could be really important with a flat cap this year. Um, Brody versus Tanev, is there one player you think is better or worse than the other, or is it just a lateral move? I think that uh, Tanev is a better version of Travis Hamanek, actually, to go with that kind of a parallel. It, the way I'm looking at it is uh, Rasmus Anderson replaces TJ Brody and Tanev replaces Hamanek in the lineup. So, yeah, I mean, you'll probably see your top pairing next year be Giordano Anderson. Your second pair will be Hannafin Tanev. Yeah, and I think that, like, overall, I don't see any real decline like on the overall for the flames in that scenario. No, I, I agree with you. I think it's a lateral move. Tanev is 30 as well. So we're essentially replacing, like you said, either uh, Brody or uh, Hannafin for Tanev at four years, 4.5 million average a year. Tanev's a guy who's played in Vancouver pretty much his whole career. And I think Tanev, like you said, he's probably a better, now that you mentioned, a better um, replacement for Hamannick. I think he is better defensively than TJ Brody. I think Tanev is the guy that you're going to get. He's not your sniper. I mean, he's had some 20-point seasons, but he's very much your defensive defenseman. And I think pairing him with with Hannafin might let Hannafin break out a little offensively as well. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And Tanev's always been a very responsible guy in his own zone and uh similar uh shot blocking capabilities as chris russell back when he was playing with the flames so it'll be interesting to see i think that ham uh, i would not be surprised if hannafin had a breakout season this year with tanev on his defense pairing it'll be interesting to see 
how everything shakes out chemistry wise between everybody because for all we know like anderson and Han- hannafin might end up being the pairing together with tana playing with geo this might and, and tell me if i don't explain this in a way that makes sense i'll try to re-explain it but i think you might be overpaying tana a little bit but i think because of it you might get a better value out of hannafin yeah, like I if, agree. if you can if you can get Tanev Hannafin to play the way I think they can, yeah, you might be overpaying one side, but you might get great value because I think Hannafin could have another breakout season, which we haven't really seen since he came to Calgary. Yeah, I agree, and I'm hoping that that's the case. So that's the storyline that I'm very much looking forward to when the season starts. Well, let's talk about the other big signing. We'll start with the two big ones. The Calgary Flames finally have a starting goaltender, something we really haven't had since... Uh, wait, wait, one sec. Goalie? That's right. What? We have one? Huh? We do. Ever since that, that kid that, fellow left town, we haven't yeah, really had one like, of those. Uh, what? <laughs> And we, we didn't just pick up somebody's sloppy second backup in a Ramo or an Elliot or something like that. We we went out and we made a big score. And I would say the Flames got the top goalie on the market. I mean, you could argue him and Holtby. But uh, Calgary again goes with a former Canuck in Jacob Markstrom. 30-year-old goaltender, signs a six-year deal here. Probably his last NHL deal. Uh, six years, $6 million average with a no-movement clause. So he's going to be probably a flame for the rest of his career. Matt, what are your thoughts on the uh, on the Markstrom signing? Well, Markstrom is basically the only reason why Vancouver made the playoffs this year and, frankly, why they haven't been a lottery pick team for the last two years. Um, yeah, the, he is one of the, at this point, one of the premier goalies in the NHL. Whether that carries on or not, you know, that'll be the question. Um, I'm hopeful <laughs> that, you know, it's just he wasn't the product of a good situation because uh, sometimes that does happen. Well, I mean, like, we saw but, that with Mike Smith, right? He looked fantastic taking a lot of rubber in uh, Phoenix. Then he comes over here and he was less than what we expected we were going to get. Yeah, or Bob Brofsky when he went to Florida and yikes. Um, so uh, we'll see. Um, it's good to have a definitive number one. I think that uh, that also kind of spells the end of Riddick, frankly. Uh, I think that... Um, Riddick's got another year. I think they just run him out this year because he's here, but I don't think he gets re-signed. Yeah. I don't think I, there's a value to go and move Riddick right now. Yeah, I think that like at the trade deadline, if Riddick is playing well enough, um, you might see him traded and like the Flames trade for just a backup. Well, when this thing happened... Him- I don't think I said this to you, but I was talking to a friend of mine. Go out and get Aaron Dell. He's cheap. Make him your backup and move Riddick. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those situations where we'll see. I I think Riddick will be like this is his last season as a flame. And if nothing else, it buys us more time to figure out who's next. Like, we've got Dustin Wolf, Tyler Parsons, Louis Domingue, Artem Zagadulin. Um, you know, it, we Parsons has been hurt. Uh, Zags isn't quite ready yet, but it lets us, it buys us some more time to figure out is one of those guys next, or do we need to go out and buy a backup? Yeah, and backups are always cheap. You can get a decent guy for like a million or two at, on free agency days. So there's a couple teams right now that have three goalies that you might even be able to slide one in off waivers. Yeah, so I like mean, if you need to, you could run Deming as your backup. Yeah, it wouldn't be ideal, but yeah, why not? I think um, with this year, and Brad, Brad Trelivin even said this, with the bubble, you're probably going to be playing a lot of hockey in a short period. So they want to have three goalies they can rely on, Markstrom, Riddick, and Deming. So I don't think you're going to see one of those guys move before the deadline. Yeah, so it, it, all in all, I think like for now the goalie situation is figured out. And whether that carries forward or not is a uh, we will see. Hopefully it's, you know, like, I'm always leery when it comes to goalies and the Flames just because, frankly, experience. (laughs) I agree with you. My worry, too, like you said, he's been playing on a Vancouver team that hasn't been great, and he's looked great, and how much more magic does he have in him? Are we buying him at the end of his magical run, 
or are we going to get a couple years out of him? And my thought on this, I think just based on what we've seen and what we've seen from similar goalies, I think we could be underpaying for two years. I think he could play like an eight or nine million dollar goalie for a couple. I think then you're you've got a really expensive older guy who is going to be splitting one A one B duties with a younger with a younger goaltender, whoever that is. I think by the end of this. He's not going to be worth six million, but I think we could get some really good hockey out of him for two, three years, and he'll look like a value. He'll look like a bargain. Yeah, and I think that like in years four, five, six, like one of the goalies that the Flames have have in the system should be in the NHL and pushing him uh, out. Basically, yeah. I mean, even even if he's playing, you know, even if he's paid six million to play forty five or fifty games in years three, four, five, six, but. Dustin Wolf or someone is making a million and a half as the as the other guy. You still got an affordable goaltending team. Exactly, and you know you just run with that, and you know like even if Wolf or whomever takes over as the starter in five and six, well, okay, you know at that rate it's you know you don't have to worry about the next guy because you already have him in stock. So yeah. And as, as I've said to you a number of times with young goalies, I've always wanted, if you're going to run a young goaltender, that veteran who you know can clean up. And yeah. you don't want two young goalies. And I think that's going to be Markstrom. I think it's almost like when they brought in Cujo to work with Kipper, I think Markstrom will be that guy that, you know, even if Wolf is having a bad night, we know we can put Markstrom in and he'll be able to clean it up. Or you can put him in the next game and he'll be able to hold his composure and you'll get a good game out of him. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So I, I think the $6 million right now looks like a bargain. Um, I'm a little worried about that no-trade clause on a six-year deal, but um, I, I think this is a good signing for the Flames. And I think they got a good value for Markstrom. I was expecting Markstrom to go for about 7.5. Yeah, and I think that the no movement is just cost of business. That like if he does get traded, that he wants to be able to say where. From what I heard is a lot of that had to do with he didn't want to be dangled for Seattle. Yeah. So I think yeah, don't blame you, him. Yeah, you've given him the you've given him the no move. You keep him here for a couple of years. He gets through the expansion draft, and then like you said, if uh, if he needs to go somewhere, he'll have a say in that. But good good signing. I'm I'm excited to see uh, Markstrom in a Flames jersey, and I'll be curious to see if he'll wear number twenty five, which is a not retired but forever flamed with Newendike, or if they'll make him pick a different number. Yeah. Uh, while we're talking about goalies, let's talk about the other goalie the Flames signed. The Calgary Flames signed another goaltender here who um, has some NHL experience, but I wouldn't say is better than the two we've got, and that's Louis Domingue, known to most fans probably from his Arizona days. He was in Vancouver last year, only played one game there, so I wouldn't call him much of a Canuck, but uh, spent most of the last season in New Jersey, and then before that, Tampa Bay and Arizona. Going by what Brad Treliving said, I think a good pickup is your number three guy if you want to run three goalies. And we saw in the playoffs, a lot of teams ended up needing more goalies in the bubble scenario, playing so much hockey so quickly. Also, I think, and my thought when we first got him, and I've said this to you for years, Matt, I sound like a broken record now, but why don't we have a veteran in the AHL? Like, I think if you put Domingue and, um, you know, Parsons or Domingue and Zagadulin, again, you've got that guy you know can clean up and who can sort of show one of those young goalies what it means to be an NHL goalie. This guy has spent most of his career in the National Hockey League. So at 700000 I think a good pickup for the Flames. Oh, yeah, for sure. And he apparently makes a great apple pie. So I yeah. didn't know that. That's the kind of guy Feaster would have wanted to pick up. Exactly. Well, that's why he played for Tampa. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, he's actually younger than, uh, than Markstrom. Markstrom's 30, he's 28. And this is the kind of guy I could see the Flames doing a bunch of one-year deals with, but we'll see what we get out of Domingue. I think, too, and I was thinking about this after the signing. Riddick has been hurt the last two years. Like, you know, I think they've pushed him through in a lot of reasons, or in a lot of ways, because they had nobody to back him up. Um, All of our AHL guys have been hurt. But I think this might also give the Flames some flexibility should Riddick get hurt again to say, okay, we've got another guy who's good enough. Yeah, and like at that rate, like if say Riddick goes down for a month, you can throw Deming in there, and uh, Markstrom would probably play almost all of the games anyway. Well, that's it. Markstrom's going to be your number one. So if Riddick goes down for a month, he wasn't planning to play a lot anyways. 
but I feel much more confident with Deming sitting on the bench if we need him than Parsons or Zagadulin. Yeah. And as you and I have talked about, you're not developing a young goalie by having him sit and watch, right? I think really with Louis Deming, you you know what you've got out of Louis Deming. He's not going to develop much more. So keeping him as your third guy that, yeah, if Reddick goes down, he's he's good enough to back up Markstrom. Mm-hmm. I would not want a Riddick Deming pairing going into the season, but I think if you were to say, yeah, okay, we've got Riddick and then you've got two number twos there, I think Deming is good enough. Yeah. Well, let's move on from him then. Not a lot else to say about Deming. Uh, the Flames did go out and sign a defenseman, and really the yeah, rest. Yeah, my most hated player in the NHL. But he's played for your, a Flor- your Florida Panthers. That's for years. why. He was the reason that the Florida Panthers screwed up the expansion draft so much because they wanted to keep Alex Petrovic and they gave uh, the Vegas Golden Knights Jonathan Marsh so uh, to take uh, oh what the heck's the guy's name uh, Riley there uh, in the draft and both Riley and Marsh so have turned into Good players. Like, yeah, for Vegas, and now Petrovic is on his third team, and yeah. And spent yeah. most of last year in the AHL. Yeah. So, a, a brilliant idea by the Florida management group there. Um, anyhow, uh, Petrovic will do a decent job as a defensive veteran guy in 20, Stockton. 28 years old, uh right shot from Edmonton. He's played, like you said, most of his career in Florida. You mentioned uh, Forbort earlier. I think I would rather have Petrovic on a one-year at 700000 than I would Forbort on a one-year at $1 million. True. Like, I, I just think for the cap flexibility, I think this is our guy who's probably our number seven. Um, you know, he's got a two-way, so he could be the veteran guy in the AHL. Either way, I'm happy with him in that position. Yep. Petrovic is good enough that should one of our other guys get hurt, I'm comfortable with him stepping in the lineup for, you know, even a month and filling NHL minutes. I'm not comfortable with him in our top six, but I'm comfortable with him as a long-term replacement. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah. He'll do the job like a number six job in a a pinch. Uh, Sort of like Stone this season. And even if he ends up going to the AHL, if there is an AHL to go to, I think, you know, could be a, a good veteran guy down there as well to work with some of the younger players. Mm-hmm. So he'll make 700000 if he's in the NHL and 300000 if he, or sorry, 700000 if he's in the NHL, 300000 if he's in the AHL. That's a one-year, two-way deal. But I think after Petrovic's long run in uh, Florida, this is a guy who's destined to be a journeyman for the rest of his career. Yeah. Uh, might as well stick on the defensive side of things and go with Nikita Nesterov next. Sure, Nikita Nesterov, a guy who really has not been in the NHL for a couple of years. Played for Tampa Bay for three years, uh, 14 through 17. Uh, played for the Montreal Canadiens for part of 16-17 and has played for CSA Moscow in the KHL for the last three years. 27 years old, um, left shot defenseman Nikita Nesterov. I think a good pickup by the Flames. I'm hoping this doesn't become the next European signing. Like, uh, what was his name? Trevanka. Yeah, Trevanka, Wolf, um, any of those guys they brought over. But again, I think a guy who, uh, one year, 700000 um, This is a guy, I think, if... I, I can see Petrovic starting in the A just because of they're paying him two-way. But I think Nesterov might end up being the number seven here because he's on a one-way. Yeah, I think he's going to be the six-seven guy. He can play on the right side, uh, even though he's a left shooting defenseman. Um, he's very much a two-way defenseman, uh, not as good defensively, um, not really that good offensively, but you know, just solid. And I think that uh, the one year here, I you know, it might be interesting to see what he has. I I don't know how well he'll play for Calgary and it's one of those things it's hard like after a guy goes to the K for three years to know exactly what you're getting without seeing him in person I mean he was in the NHL for four years he put up decent numbers you know seven points nine points 12 points for a two-way guy so he's good enough to play in the league 
And, and like you said, I don't know how well he's going to play, but I also don't know how well he needs to play. He's going to be the number seven, if not in the AHL. I think is really your number seven, in my opinion, should be a two-way guy. You don't want to leave a, you know, you don't want to leave yourself open if you lose an offensive guy or a defensive guy. You want someone who can play a little bit of both. I think he's going to be fine as a one-year number seven, Matt. Yeah. And I think both uh, Nesterov and Petrovic are signed because we lack defensive depth. I think that's a spot they would rather give to. I mean, honestly, I would rather see a Poolman or um, somebody like that in that spot, but I think all those guys need another year of seasoning, and I think both these guys are here for one year just until we've got somebody else ready. Yep. I don't think this is a guy you see, and I think you're right. He might not be ready after the KHL, but this is a guy you might see here for one year and then back to Europe after this. Yeah, and it, I think he might fill in. Like I, I would be somewhat surprised if he played more than 20 or tw- 25 games this yeah. season, but, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I think like you said with uh, Petrovic, I think Petrovic starts in the A just because um, he's on a two-way, but I think this is your Michael Stone. This is your guy that he travels with the team, is there with the team, he fills in when you need him to, but if you need a long-term fill-in, I'm not sure he's the guy you put in there. He's the guy that plays in a back-to-back when somebody's, you know, not feeling well or a little banged up. And then we have three forwards to talk about for the Flames. Uh, let's let's start with uh, the guy who played in Boston last year, Joachim Nordstrom, named after the clothing store. I'm not sure. Probably not. I think there's a Joachim uh, furn- piece of furniture at Ikea. So the retail man, we'll call him. Uh, 28-year-old center who shoots left. Played for Boston the last two years, got 12 points to his name in 2018, uh, seven points in 2019. His best season was with Carolina in 2015, 2016, where he got 24 points. Um, this, I think, really becomes your sort of your fourth line fill in guy. I think this is really your Tobias Reader replacement. Yeah, Nordstrom is a very good physical player uh, who can play very good defensively, and he gives all effort all the time Uh, the exact type of guy that you'd like to have on your team in the playoffs and i think that uh philosophically i think that it's a good correction for this team to be going away from guys like mark jankowski and tobias reader who are very passive in how they play and getting guys who are more present in a physical sense, like probably Nordstrom less one dimensional might also be another way to say that. I think, you know, Janko was good on one side of the ice and could do one thing well. And I think Nordstrom brings a couple aspects to the team. Yeah. And like, especially like this team is built to be a physical bruising team, um, with the type and characters of the players in the organization. So, uh, getting a guy like Nordstrom to replace a Jankowski or a Reader helps just to bring more of like what the identity of the team is supposed to be. We don't know what's going to happen next year. I mean, we don't even know when the NHL is going to play, much less if the HL is going to play. But I can see the the roster sizes being expanded from 23 to probably 28 or 30. And I think Nordstrom's a guy you probably don't have in your starting lineup, but for a long season where you're going to play a lot of hockey quickly, he's the kind of guy I could see being your almost fifth line player um, if you've got you know that many spots, and a guy you can rely on to fill in when you need some muscle in the lineup. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think sort of like we're saying with the defenseman, a guy that you could look at and go, yeah, okay, he can play when we need him to, but I, I think he's probably only here because. We want some more NHL bodies for next season. Uh, the next player the Flames bring in played for the Pittsburgh Penguins his whole career, and that's Dominic Simon, another left shot centerman, twenty six years old, five foot eleven. Uh, so basically, this is a trade between the Penguins and the Flames of Dominic Simon for Mark Jankowski. And in that case, so- I think we win. I I like I like Simon better. I think Simon is Same. more. What's that? Same. I, I think Simon is much more what you want out of a bottom six guy in that he's much more responsible than Janko defensively. He's not your big hitter. He's not your, you know, muscle guy. But I think he's, and this, I might get some hate mail for this. He's a poor man's, a poor, poor man's Michael Backlund. I think he can be the, 
the offensive guy who he needs to be, but he's much more defensively responsible. And I think he's going to work well on that bottom six because of that. Yeah, and the fact that like he can slot in up and down the lineup as well. Like he was playing on a line with Crosby at times this season. Yeah, and you I don't know, want him he... in our top six, but he like no, you said, he can but... slot in there if he needs to. Yeah, it, he's a, a good playmaker. He just his finishing ability is lacking, and like I think that if his finishing ability was better, he'd probably be getting three or four million dollars instead of seven hundred thousand. Um, just question, because Crosby, Crosby was feeding him quite a few good passes, and he just wasn't able to finish the plays off. And um, the but question I, th- I, I have about him, and my boss asked the same question: Is this is kind of Derek Ryan making what Derek Ryan should be making? Does Simon coming in make Ryan expendable if you can find a buyer, or do you buy Simon, or do you buy Ryan out? Uh, Ryan's fine. You know, like, the thing is, is that I would much rather spend on good quality two-way centers and, you know, perhaps spend a little too much on that and go with, like, bargain basement wingers instead uh, just because center is always the hardest position to get. And, you know, Ryan, Backlund, Monaghan, Lindholm, Simon, you know, between, like, all of those guys... You know, we have enough quality centers that, you, it, yeah, of course you'd prefer to spend that money on, like, a higher scoring guy. But, you know, Ryan does a lot of what you need. I could see the Flames if, let's assume, you know, things work as normal next season. I could see the Flames try to sneak Ryan through waivers and send him to Stockton because I think he'd be a good leader for some of the young players down there. And put, uh, uh, I I don't I don't think that Ryan's bad enough where you'd want to wave him. I don't think he's well. You'd have to wave him to send him down. Yeah, I, like I don't like. Uh, I don't know if he's bad enough, but I I I could see them want to tag up the cap space. Well, Tarek Ryan to me is has been worth more than what we've paid him to this point. So yeah. that that's one of those things that like you're in my mind like you'd be hurting your team to get rid of him like I think that he's done an admirable job thus far and you know uh, like yeah I don't disagree it, with you I can just see them wanting to take up some cap space yeah I I think there's other ways of doing that though maybe um, and then the last guy we brought in another Canuck. Uh, Joshua Levo, a right shot left winger, who I imagine since the Flames don't have enough uh, left wingers, or sorry, don't have enough right wingers, will try to move him to the right. Played most of his career with Toronto. Um, probably well known mostly from his time in Toronto. He's six foot two, 192 pounds, um, and 27 years old. This is a signing I like for league minimum. I can see Levo, or just over league minimum, I guess, 875. I can see Levo being a regular player on this team. Yeah, I think that what you're going to end up seeing from him is him playing up and down the lineup throughout the year. Um, I think that he'll probably start on the third line. Uh, I think I he'd be... be good on a line with Lucic and Bennett. Yeah, that's uh, basically exactly where I was going with that. Uh, either Dubé, Bennett, and uh, Levo, or Lucic, Bennett, and Levo. So, yeah. Um, of like minds there. And I, I think he can chip in quite a bit. And, yeah. Uh, the, if he needs to go up the lineup, that's great. If down, that's great too. And, like, if you don't want to even play him, 875, that's cheap. So. And I think also a guy who, if he has a good season, could have some value at the at the deadline. Yep. So, Matt, last year it seemed like Calgary went out and bought up all the uh, available assets in Edmonton. This year it seems like we bought up all the available assets in Vancouver. So next year we go buy mm-hmm. up all the available assets in Winnipeg? Well, it's one of those things that, like, uh, I've seen some photoshops of, uh, like, uh, Welcome to Calgary – uh, for like insert player here and like uh, Finn the Canucks mascot. I saw know. somebody who took the flaming C and put Finn at the top of it. 
Yeah, or uh, the Flames have introduced the fourth jersey, and it's just a Flames-colored Canucks jersey. Um. <laughs> it's just interesting that you know over the last couple of years we've seen so many players come from one team in both Western Canadian teams. It tells you our Western Canadian pro scout has earned his money. Well, the thing is, is that like with both Edmonton and Vancouver, like not all of their players are bad, and so. We also because see we, them both a lot, so we become familiar with yeah, these guys. Yeah, and you know what they bring. And so if they're both not bad and you can get them, why not? And, like, you look at Milan Lucic, like, he brought a lot to the team last season. Same with Cam Talbot. Uh, even Tobias Reeder. And, like, they, they were three of the more impactful players for the Flames in the postseason. And... You know, like if the Flames have pillaged Vancouver of their good uh, spare parts, then that would be awesome. You know, and a couple of years ago, I mean, we were looking at the players the Flames brought in as sort of those extra NHL guys, and it was, you know, Buddy Robinson and, you know, Byron Ferrosi and, um, you know, guys like that that we were seeing the Flames bring in Zarnik. And I think if you look at sort of both last season and this season, you know, if we look at this season, Nordstrom, Simon, Levo, I think you're bringing in better quality tweeners than we've seen in the last couple of years. Oh, for sure. And, like, this is what I was mentioning earlier, where, like, all 12 of the forward positions are important. Like, if you ran a line of, say, Nordstrom, Simon, and Levo as your fourth line... It's a good NHL line. Yeah. Like, that's a f- better-than-average fourth line. And... You know, like, then you don't have to really worry about them being out there, and then you can just get back to the Gaudreau line, and then the Kachuk line, and then the Lucic line, and you just can cycle up and down the lineup, and you, you're fine. Like, and that's something that, at times, like, I think that was part of the stumbling block for the Flames last year, is guys like Jankowski disappointed to the extent that they did that it caused issues just because the depth struggled and like guys like Froelich fell off the face of the earth to the point where he was dealt you know it just it'll be interesting to see uh what if the these guys actually do bring more to their game than and like this team could roll on all four cylinders if they're going um it's a lot more complete of a forward group than years past. You and I have talked in the past about maybe some of the players here not wanting to play or disappearing at certain points. And, you know, do we need to make personnel changes because this team's not getting it done? And the way I look at it is with these players that we're bringing in, in uh, Nordstrom, Simon, and Levo, I think this is management's way of saying, yeah, we have had some guys who haven't wanted to be here, haven't shown up. And now we have replacements. If you're not going to play, we have somebody else who's capable and wanting to take that job and we'll put them in the lineup. That's kind of the message I get from these signings. It's not buddy Robinson. You're like, yeah, okay. He's not really going to take my job. You've got very qualified NHL, you know, NHL bottom six guys and all three of these guys that if you don't want to play, they'll take your spot. Well, plus it's also throwing the gauntlet down to guys like Matthew Phillips and Glenn Godden and the other drafted forwards that are in Stockton that, okay, you want to actually make the NHL. Good for you. Be better than one of these three. Yeah, go beat them out of yeah. their spot. And, you know, until you do that, get your butt in gear and until you can actually do it, then let's see. Well, and sort of like we talked about with the goaltenders, I think also buys us a year there where, yeah, Phillips is good. We'll bring him up. You know, if Godden's ready, we'll bring him up. If not, it buys us a year to not have to rush those guys into the NHL. Yep. So I'm I'm happy with all the signings the Flames made. I don't look at any player the Flames signed and go, oh, that was a bad signing or we paid too much. We avoided the overpaying for a top-line winger that we've seen Tree do a few times. No um, Brody or, or sorry, no Brower contract coming out here. Uh, no Neil contract coming out of this. But I think when I look at this, I say, yeah, this is a really good year for the flames. And I think these are all players, you know, outside of Tanev and, uh, Markstrom who are here for many years. These are all guys that I could see 
earning a spot to be with the Flames for a number of years. Yeah, and I think that uh, with these signings, I think that the Flames now become one of the most complete teams in terms of having quality players at every position. Because, like, you look at a lot of teams, and, like, there are some players on the team that's like, wow, um, you're in the NHL, are you? Um, okay. And, well, and, that, and that's happening with two expansion teams. I mean, that's essentially 50 new players that are going to have NHL jobs. Yeah, and, like, especially, like, if you look north to Edmonton, like, they have, like, six quality forwards at the NHL level, and then the rest, it's like, um, okay. Uh, like, honestly, those players, I wouldn't even put any of them above the guys that we just signed for the league minimum. And, you know, and a lot of teams are constructed that way, where it's just the top-end guys only and not any f real focus on high-quality depth. And I think that's going to be one of the huge benefits for the Flames and why I think that they might have a good season again, at least in the regular season because of that depth yeah there's there's been times in the past where we've seen buddy robinson and you know zarnik be brought up and, and they're just a a filler and i think like you said these guys are all nhl regulars and just as a note on the regulars um Dom, dominic simon is an rfa after this season so that's the guy i think if the flames really want to keep around you could probably get you know you'll keep his rights you'll qualify him but that's a guy i could see sticking around i think all these guys are the guy that you could see stick around till they hit a million like that seems to be sort of that that magic number that will keep you while you're cheap and when you hit a million out you go yeah sort of like uh garnett hathaway yeah, Hathaway, I think there's a lot of guys that have been in that position in the past. Which, uh, with Hathaway, like, what you're, the difference between Joachim Nordstrom and Hathaway is not that much, and certainly not, like, a million and a half worth difference. So, you know, getting the cheaper of the two players is definitely good for the flames and i know plus, plus plus he's best friends with lidstrom or lindholm and uh, markstrom so i know as fans we like dube dube still an unproven quantity in the nhl i mean i know a lot of people are penciling him in on the, on the second line but i think this also buys you some flexibility there that if dube's not playing the way we need to we can now afford to drop him and try somebody else and i think when i was looking at this lineup going into this season I was saying, you know, we don't have a lot of flexibility for who could play on the second line. And I could totally see Dubé and uh, Levo kind of swapping the num number two, number three right wing spots. Well, like even uh, Manjapane, like, you know, like all three of those guys, Levo, Manjapane, and Dubé, have all had flashes at times of higher end ability, but at times not consistent and like i think eat bread might be a cement himself as a fixture on the kachuk line with backland but um you know whether dube can keep his spot on the third line or if he gets pushed down to the fourth line i think will depend a lot on just their approach and hopefully those players could keep going and with their development and take next steps to push themselves even further than where they're at yeah it definitely buys us some some interesting options i'm sure we'll talk about that before the season starts with where these guys might all slot in lineup wise but definitely as you said a more complete lineup than we've seen in the past both on the forward side and the defensive side and having that number one starter i think really puts the cherry on top of a more complete lineup yeah definitely i mean you've thought the flames were going to run for the cup for a number of years but i think if you look at them now they have the main piece you need to be a big contender, which is a bona fide top goaltender. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, like, honestly, if the Flames had Markstrom this playoffs, I think they win the cup. But, you know. And that was with the team that, you know, because they came close to beating Dallas out outright anyway. And, you know if they had better goaltending throughout i think that might have been the difference but we'll see like everything 
Well, we have three guys, or I guess five guys here that have been re-signed. I don't think we'll really need to talk about any of these guys, but uh, one of them. But let's just go through them all. Buddy Robinson's coming back, one year, 700K. I think his chances of making it as an NHL regular now are dashed, but good farmhand. Uh, Byron Ferrosi, same thing. I th two years, 225K per year. Again, I think good farmhand. His chances, at least this year, are dashed of making the team with the guys we've just brought in. Glenn Godden, one year, 700K. I was surprised only one year, but I think this is a one more year of 700K before they've got to start paying him NHL money and bring him to the NHL or move him to a team that will. And Zach yeah. Ronaldo also coming back. And again, I think a good farmhand there. Probably the one we should discuss is Andrew Mangiapane. Obviously learned his lesson last year of holding out till training camp and getting whatever scraps are left on the table for contract money. Uh, two years, $2.45 million per year. What do you think of that deal, Matt? Well, last year I remember us uh, comment making bad commentaries about uh, whoever was advising him. Please, uh, sir, may I have a contract? Yeah, because uh, yeah, it was not a brilliant decision, and like I know on our show we were both saying bet on yourself. Yeah, and he did, and hey, you're making nearly like a million and a half more a season. Awesome. Good for you. And, you know, keep it up, and hopefully that co the next contract after is, starts with a four or a five. I think a little bit rich for Mangiapane based on the little experience he has, but I think if he can play to his potential, it'll be a good deal. Yeah. Well, if you look at his five-on-five -five production, he was actually producing as a first-liner last season, believe it or not, so take that for what it's worth um and he's still an rfa when this is over yeah so you know if he can keep progressing and developing then hey that would be just a-ok -okay in my books <laughs> yeah i mean by the time his contract is over you'll be losing ryan bennett um and all the guys that we've signed now so there's some more money that could be available for him at that point um mm -hmm. he's making just less than bennett now and i think you know I think this year we might overpay him a little bit. I think next year it could look like a value if we're, um, you know, if we're paying him 2.45. But, yeah, I think as a 24-year-old, you're paying for potential a little bit on this one. I think 1.8 to 2 million would be about market value, but I think we're giving him uh, 400,000 paying for potential. Yeah, and, like, if he can produce, like, if he has the same season next year as he did this year, the easily worth the two and a half and um if he takes another step forward then you're laughing basically so. yeah i mean last year 1920 was the first year he played a whole season in the nhl 68 games 17 goals 15 assists for 32 points 2.5 million for a guy who gets 30 points uh not a bad deal if he can continue that i mean you look at a, a free agent comparable mike hoffman had a 30 point season you know, Backland had a 30-point season. They're both still looking for a deal, and we paid 2.4 for a guy who got a 30-point season last year. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think it, I, I think it, it's not going to break the bank. It's not going to be a contract we want to get out of. I think if he's playing on your second line, paying less than 2.5 for a guy on your second line is going to be more than worth it for the Flames. Yeah, and I think that, like, to start the season, he will play with Kachuk and Backlund. I think the chemistry that was there late in the season was... I think it's his spot to lose. Yeah, and we'll see. Um, his destiny basically is up to him, and he has the, enough talent and the drive that if he can put those things together, he could be a good, like, borderline first line player in the nhl and this is so. really i think his show me contract at the end of this he's either going to be in for a big payday like you said starting with a four or you could drop down to being a million dollar player like i think this is the deal you got to prove yourself on yeah uh, well put it this way if he goes back the other way i don't even think he'd be it'd be more like a jankowski situation of yeah okay somebody will pay him yeah i know just not necessarily us yeah, it depends what that roster looks like in two years. But I could sure. see them – they like him. I could see them keeping him around as a fourth-line guy then. But who knows what, what things will look like in two years. Yep. 
Um, anybody else on this list you want to talk about? I would say I think they're being very generous with Byron Ferrosi to give him two years. Um, uh, he was a quality AHL guy, so I he think he was that's about a point I... per game. Yeah. Uh, Ronaldo, good to have him back, just because sometimes you need a guy who can drop him. And... and if nothing else, you need a you need that guy in the AHL to agitate down there and keep some of your young stars safe. Yep. Um, I guess the one that surprised me was the Glenn Godden deal. I I don't think there's room for him in the NHL yet. I think just looking at our at our roster, there's no room for him. I was expecting a little more than 700k, but I think. I, I really think this is the year that we have to decide what to do with Godden. Like, if you, if you look at Godden, he's 23, he's on a 700,000, he's an RFA. I think he's either destined for the NHL next year or you got to move the asset. What do you think? Well, I think that uh, Godden is a very smart and responsible player. And I think that, like, when there's an injury somewhere. I think he will be the guy that's recalled first. Um, I think and... you've got enough NHL bodies, though. I'm not sure you're going to need to bring him up for that long. Oh, I know. It just, it depends on like how significant. If it's a insert miscellaneous fourth line guy, then no. But like if say Backlund goes down, then I could see like Ryan taking Backlund's spot. Everybody and pushes then up and, and God and take Ryan's spot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I don't think he, I know fans want to see him here, but I'm not sure he's quite ready yet. From what I've seen, we'll have to talk to our uh, our our Stockton insider, Stockton's finest, at some point. I don't think he's quite NHL ready, and I think this just buys him another year of development. Yeah, and he, I think he will make his NHL debut this season. I just don't. know. I think you're right. If... I just don't think he's ready to be an NHL regular. Yeah, and I think that like next season afterwards then uh, if he does take the requisite steps then i think he would be more of a player that you would rely on as oh this is the 12th forward or 13th well, forward. to me ryan's off the books at the end of this year i think he replaces ryan in the depth chart yeah i could see that you know like ryan's making 3.3 3 million i don't think you re-sign him for that after this He's the UFA. I think you uh, would... Just asking, with uh, Ryan, would you resign him for, say, like two years at $2 million? If If Godden's ready, no. Um, I think Ryan is... I mean, Ryan's 33. I wouldn't want to do a, a two-year deal after that. That's where you're getting into bad money territory. Ryan would be a guy I think I would let him walk. I'd let him go and see what he can get. And I might look to re-sign him if he's not signed by camp. But well, I think I think this is a year you have to... I mean, between Godden, between Simon, between you know a few other guys, I think somebody can take the step to replace Ryan. Yeah. I just... I don't know that that's a good way to spend $2 million in a flat cap era. Uh, I like I like Ryan. I just think he might be the victim of a cap. I agree. And, and, and I think that might be what you end up telling Godden is, you know what? This guy's off the book. Show us you can take his spot next year. So, yeah, yeah that that's my thought there. I, I I think somebody will pay him $2 million. I'm just not sure where the guys – I could see him end up in Seattle. Yeah. Um, I just – you know, I, I don't know that that's the best way for the Flames to spend $2 million next year when we look at some of the deals they have to re-sign. Um, so, Matt, with that in mind, any outstanding UFAs you think we should go after? And if so, wh where would that money come from? I mean, if we look at the list of guys that are outstanding, Mike Hoffman, Michael Granlin, Ilya Kovalchuk, Eric Halla, Carl Soderberg, Anthony Duclair, any Sammy Vatanen, anyone you think we should go after? And if so, where do you find that money? We got a million dollars um, right now. If uh, they do sign someone, I think it'll be just another depth defenseman, and I the million I guess would be the amount. Do you do you try to bring in Chara for a million as your number seven? Oh, that would be great. Forty um, four year old Chara. I, hell, I'd have him on the the second or third pairing at that rate. Um, yeah, no, if if the Flames could sign Char, sure, why not? Like, give me a break. That that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, 
you see, this is where having Milan Lucic helps. Just get him to harass him on the phone all the time and say, Hey, come, you know, have some fun in the mountains. Of all those guys, I at the beginning of the offseason, I want us to go after uh, Hoffman, but I don't think Hoffman takes less than three, and we don't have three million. I don't think you have enough assets to move. You would have to move Riddick to bring in Hoffman. Yeah, and honestly, I think that like we have enough forwards now that... You don't you know, need like, another one. No, because uh, you also have to allow the young guys like Dubé, uh, Bennett... Manjapane, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to take those next steps and have some leeway to actually learn at the mm. NHL level. And, you know, if you're muddying the water with filler guys, that's not... If we hadn't gone out and got Levo, Nordstrom, and Simon, I would say the Flames should try to get Granlin for a million and a half. But again, I think yeah. we've got too many forwards as it is. Um, the yeah. one, the one forward I'd be okay if they could get for less than a million and a half would be Anthony Duclair. He's 25. I think he could be a young forward who could grow into the system. And at 25, I don't think he's reached his peak yet. Yeah, that would be a decent add-on, and I think he would join the group of the young guys. Um, just it, again, it it would just depend. A, yeah. a lot of things and, and, and at a million bucks as much as I agree with you that I think they'll try to get a number seven I also don't know who like I don't think they want 300,000 available I think you've got enough guys who could be the number seven with uh, the ones that we brought in now um, with Nesterov and um, Petrovic I don't know that it's worth going out and spending another 700,000 and getting that close to the cap yeah you know for a number seven I think those guys are serviceable um, you know, you look at Giordano, Hannafin, Anderson, Tanev, uh, Valimaki won't be here. Shillington's still unsigned. I think that's where you spend your 700000 800000 And I think um, I think you're done after that. Like, there's no other money. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the Flames can do. And I think if they need money, the only thing they could really do is try to move Riddick. But the question is then, who goes to be your backup goaltender? Yeah. You know, like if you move his two point seven five million to bring in somebody else, what are we going to do? Are we comfortable going with um, Deming. Markstrom, Deming, and Zaga Doolin as our three? I don't know. If if the NA, if the AHL doesn't play, I think I'm more comfortable moving on from Riddick, knowing we could rotate out the third goalie. Yeah. If the AHL does play, I think all those guys are better served playing in the AHL. I agree. Um, so we'll, we'll see what the Flames do, but that's our, our off-season wrap-up, and unless the Flames make a big signing, we're not going to do another show because the Flames brought in Chara as the number seven, but if a big signing happens, we might be back. Otherwise, Matt, I think we're, we're pretty much done until the season starts. Yeah, until at least training camps are underway and all that kind of fun stuff and figure out like where people are playing which countries are uh, the canadian teams destined to pull a toronto blue jays and play in buffalo or you know insert miscellaneous team league here so and i'll yeah. even be curious to see if training camp is longer this year i mean for some of these guys if we bring in a guy like duclair who's in ottawa he hasn't played since march who knows what kind of shape he's in you know, some of these guys haven't played in a while, so I think you're going to need more. I could almost see if the league starts Jan 1, like they're talking about, starting your camp on December 1st. Yeah. And I don't know how many exhibition games you're going to be able to get, but it might be a lot of inter-squad stuff. Yeah, and I think that you'll see a lot of, uh, like, scrim internal scrimmages. I can see it being a lot of NHL versus AHL type scrimmage of, you know, we'll have the, the red team is our guys we know are on the NHL. The black team is our tweeners and NHL guy, and AHL guys and just have those guys scrimmaging. Yeah. I don't think the league wants to move players around during the COVID time for an exhibition game. Yeah, true enough. The only thing I could see working is if you were to have, let's say, all the Western Canadian teams all hold their camp in Edmonton and then they'd play against each other. Sort of like the uh, Penticton Rookie Tournament. Yeah. Exactly. Well, 
Well, before we sign off today, I just want to remind everybody that we have our listener survey going on. We do this every year. Um, this is your chance to let us know what you think of the show. If you want more or less of something, if there's something you want us to change or have a suggestion for next year, we want to know from you guys what you want to hear on the show. So if you go to our website, and we'll have this in the show notes as well, uh, firesidechat.ca slash survey, you'll see the survey there. It probably takes about 10 minutes to fill out, not that long at all. But we're asking things like, How'd you hear about us? What would you like more of? What would you like less of? Um, do you want more Oilers bashing? Do you want us to bash a different team instead? What is it you want us to do on the show? And we try to take that into account when we set up next season. So fill that out. At the very end of the survey, if you want to put in your name and your email, it's totally optional. But if you put in your name and email at the end, you'll be entered into a draw for some cool prize packs. Um, we have one prize pack this year. We've got, I think, a jersey in there, one of the old third jerseys. The script one Matt was talking about earlier, a fireside chat koozie and t-shirt. I think we got a flames hat. And if I remember, there's a signed Jamie McCowan photo in there as well. So some random flame stuff that uh, we've had either from us or been donated and some cool fireside chat stuff as well. So if you want to be part of that survey, give us your name at the end and your email and we'll put you into that draw. If you don't want to be part of the draw, just fill out the survey. Don't give us your info. And, uh, and you can fill it out and still give us your comments. So it's totally up to you how much information you want to give us. Matt, it's weird that it's snowing outside and we're not going to be talking about hockey for a while. I know. It's, we have entered the twilight zone. You know, it's, and this means it, it'll it's, probably be July and we'll be covering the Stanley Cup Finals. Exactly. You know, that, that's the way you want it, right? You know, stampede and... You know, the Stanley Cup. Sure, why in, not? Instead of the stampede where it's like, hey, get a ticket and you get to see Brad Paisley play. It'll be, get your ticket to the grounds and also get into game six of the Cup. If you're one of that, the 6,000 fans, it's allowed to be in attendance. <laughs> one every six seats. Yep. Um, we want to hear as well from you guys and what you think of the free agent signings. Were they good? Were they bad? Did the Flames overpay for anybody? Or is there anyone you still want to see the Flames bring in let us know your thoughts either on facebook or facebook.com slash fireside chat uh, let us know on twitter we're at fireside podcast or give us a call leave a message on our voicemail line and we'd be happy to play your thoughts on the next show our voicemail line if you do want to call us is 587-200-7176 again that number is 587-200 7176. Either leave us a voicemail or send us a text if you'd rather do that. And make sure if you send us a text, you leave your name so we know who sent us the text. But uh, let us know what you think. I think we've all got some time to ponder these for a while. So, Matt, I guess that's it for us. Yep. Do you want to no, take us another out? Another very bizarre end to the season. And Tis the, uh, tis the season, though, right? I mean, this is... Yeah. This is what we're expecting. I think it's going to be a bizarre season for a long time. Yeah. Well, like even the free agency was just odd entirely for all the teams in the NHL. And yeah, it, I'm hoping this season sort of resets free agent spending. Yeah. You know, I, that, I think, I think this might be setting new norms for what free agents go for and how many get signed. I'm hoping it's not just a one year anomaly. True. Because, yeah, some really stupid contracts out there. Well, Matt, do you want to take us out the way we'd usually go out and we'll save yep. these words because it might be a while till we hear them again? Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.